Oh, good morning. Greetings from Sydney, Australia. I'm down by the Olympic Park and uh, it's a beautiful morning again. I thought today I'd like to talk about uh, the composition of water-fed poles because um, there's a lot of confusion about that and there's a lot of um, misrepresentation, I think, in, um, in what window cleaners should be used if they're professionals. So the compositions which exist are uh, from cheapest to most expensive aluminium, fiberglass, or aluminium, sorry, <laughs> fiberglass. Then after fiberglass is what we call hybrid, which is where you mix fiberglass into a carbon fiber pole or carbon fiber into a fiberglass pole, but there's no true definition of it. And then there's 100% carbon fiber, then high modulus carbon fiber, and then ultra high modulus carbon fiber. Now the definitions of high modulus and ultra high modulus are not actually well defined. Um, basically Unger led the sort of the marketing push with a high mod um, definition. And so I think pretty much the industry has, uh, has conformed to that lead and then the same as they coined the phrase ultra high mod. Um, and so the industry has followed that lead. Um, and then there's also Kevlar as a coating, right? So that's the, the other sort of latest um, development. So let's talk about what the composition is for. Um, if we start at the bottom, aluminium or aluminium is the composition that you'd find in a swimming pool pole. And if you want to know the real value of an aluminium pole, go and have a look at a swimming pool cleaning pole. Uh, you know, we could make a 20 foot aluminum pole for about six dollars. So that would give you the evidence that that's the, the real value of those um, poles. And uh, alum look, what you're looking for is rigidity. And uh, if you can get aluminum to be rigid, I mean, it's certainly rigid at four feet. It's definitely rigid at eight feet, you know, so that's why as a standard window cleaners pole, it's still quite um, useful. But it's also, you know, heavier than, um, than carbon fiber. So as you get longer, um, the pole is not only um, heavier, but it also starts to flex under its own weight. It doesn't have the rigidity qualities that carbon fiber does. So aluminum is genuinely not suitable for a water-fed pole, um, you know, at two stories and three stories and things like that. But um, it's sold like globally and you can understand in developing countries like, you know, um, where uh, the currency might be 30 to 1, like the Rand in South Africa or the Baht in Thailand, you know, that means a thousand dollar pole is 30,000 Rand or 30,000 RMB, uh, or not RMB, Baht, right? So wherever you, wherever you are in the world, you can understand that those people don't have the big money, so they'll buy the cheaper pole. Labor is not such an issue as far as the work safety. They don't really care so much if there's an injury. Um, they don't care so much if there's a repetitive motion injury. It's just um, you have work and you work. So the next one up is fiberglass, and fiberglass was really the beginning. If we go back to 2006 when I got involved in the industry, fiberglass poles were everywhere. And, um, and that's pretty much what we started selling in 2009 even, was fiberglass and hybrid, <coughs> pardon me. And uh, fiberglass poles are, again, incredibly inefficient. They're suitable, like, you could use anything to reach. You can use a piece of bamboo to reach. So this is where I think the great confusion is in the industry, is that the first question is, how high do you want to reach? And then people go, oh, 30 feet. So now I want to compare 30 foot poles based on price because they reach. But actually what you should be looking for is um, is rigidity because it's the rigidity that gives you the uh, precision and the accuracy. And you can't underestimate how important it is that you're earning your money as an hourly rate. So the faster you can work, the more money you're gonna make out of that out of that job and the more jobs you can fit into a day. So reach is really just a very basic parameter of the decision-making process. So fiberglass, its weakness is it's heavy and it flexes. It's very flexible. So when you start to talk about, you know, using a fiberglass pole and it flexing, it's not suitable 
because um, the definition of work, right? So work is actually a physics term, it's a scientific term. I'll show you a little bit of the native bush. Um, work is defined as force through distance, and distance is displacement, there's a particular um, sort of smaller definition there. And so if you, um, if you have a pole that's whipping, then you're going to put more force through more distance to control it. So a fiberglass pole is really incredibly inefficient and you know it's going to work is measured in joules or calories. So you're actually going to need to eat more which means you'll spend more on food to work a cheaper pole like a fiberglass pole for example. I mean that's kind of like a, a corny thing to say but it's actually in physics terms it's actually true. So again, when somebody starts out a mortar-fed window cleaning, if they get sold an expensive pure water system and then all of a sudden the only money they've got left over is for a fiberglass pole and then they get sold a fiberglass pole, is um, this person's income capability is completely stunted and their, eff their effectiveness and possibly even just whether they even like using mortar-fed is completely affected by that sale. Right, that choice, which somebody like if, instead of encouraging them and almost requiring them to get uh, a, a, a rigid, you know, 100% carbon fiber pole, for example, um, they end up with a tool that's inefficient, flexible, potentially injurious, like seriously potentially injurious, and um, and to the point that they may just put it away and continue climbing ladders and doing the work traditionally as a result of that sale, you know. So that's where I think it's really important that that the, the composition of poles is discussed and, and brought into the open. So the next definition is hybrid. Hybrid is, again, and it's, a, it's a term coined by the industry. It means mix, and there's no definition of the mix. So I can make, um, and I'm gonna make a video when I get back to the factory, um, I can show you a fiberglass pole with 3K wrapped around it, and you can't tell the difference. For you, you're gonna say it's carbon fiber. And I can tell you it's hybrid, but it's only got one layer of carbon fiber on the outside. And so let's say that the average pole has got seven layers of, uh, of uh, composite. Fiberglass is twice the thickness of carbon fiber. So if you put you know, two layers of, of fiberglass, you'd have three layers of carbon fiber, or three layers of fiberglass and one layer or two layers of carbon fiber. So you can see that there's no real definition of what hybrid means, and so somebody could say it's hybrid. Now, here's another definition of hybrid. There are poles out there that are called hybrid legitimately but I can tell you based on their LDI or their length displacement index how much they sag in the middle with weight that they are fiberglass. Now when somebody calls it hybrid what do they mean? I can tell you that in the very top sections where the sections are small then they have some carbon fiber in them but as the sections get bigger and the diameter is bigger than the rigidity of the section in its own in its own sort of design and size is more rigid. So these poles could be legitimately called hybrid because they've got some carbon fiber in them, but many of their sections could be 100% fiberglass. So that's kind of like puts a, a whole another slant on what you know a legitimate legal meaning of the word hybrid could be. So, but it definitely doesn't mean 50/50. That's not its definition. Okay, so next is 100% carbon fiber, and I think what I've found over the years is people don't know that much about carbon fiber and they want to make a very simple decision about carbon fiber and they don't get it that there are many 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 there's thousands of carbon fibers right there's actually only six companies in the world that make the raw material but then from there there's thousands of companies that make um, different you know um, products out of it like the hair is you know which carbon fiber is like you know traditionally you know, long fibers, and then they join those fibers together in different um, formats to make um, what's called prepreg, where they mix the resin in with it, and it becomes in a sheet, so it's easier for the for the manufacturer to work with. So, um, the first level we could say is an intermediate modulus. Modulus means rigidity or stiffness in relation to weight. 
so um, you're going to have 100% carbon fiber, which is um, pretty much what we all call carbon fiber. Then coming up from that is high modulus, and then high modulus means it's more stiff for its weight. And then when we coin the phrase ultra high modulus, we're just saying that we're buying even more stiff. Now, as a manufacturer, when we buy the raw material from intermediate to um, high modulus to ultra high modulus is costing us practically double each time we go up. It's um, it's in that dimension. And there's another there's another quality of carbon fiber which is higher than that again, which is what's used to build like the Boeing Dreamliner and things like that. But that's not really affordable yet um, for you know the likes of waterfed poles, and it's also not necessary. Um, you know, because the ultra high modulus is really doing the job um, that's needed, you know, for cleaning seven and eight stories. So, the reason why we would choose different modulus is to get the correct rigidity in the pole at the operating height. Now, if you have a fixed length pole, and there's a lot of um, companies that, you know, have traditionally sold fixed length poles then what they can do is actually design that pole to have the rigidity that they expect it to have at the given height. So if somebody says you can get a 22 foot pole, a 35 foot pole or a 43 foot pole, then they can actually design that pole using combinations of hybrid carbon fiber, high modulus carbon fiber, and they don't pull it apart. So you've got, they don't have to consider any alternative use of that pole other than its 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 extended length and that's how you can find cheaper um, fixed length poles because they the the designer can say well look there's no point in us putting 100 percent high modulus carbon fiber in the handle because the handle is never going to flex so we could go back to intermediate modulus carbon fiber in the handle for example now, where that doesn't happen is where you have companies like Reachit and Unger, which have um, taken up the pull-apart um, thinking so that you know you can actually extend a master pole. And when you have this pull-apart thinking, you can't compromise the design and maximize your profit or, or reduce the, the, the cost of a product by fiddling with the um, with the composition of it, you know, knowing because you actually know the ultimate parameter of that pole. But if you have something like um, the Reach It Mini, which is a 25 foot pole, it pulls apart to 14 feet and 4 feet, but it can also be extended with plus A, plus B, and plus C to 50 feet of actual length, so a 55 foot reach. So the the Reach It Mini as a 25 foot pole or an Ungo pole, you know, like a carbon pole or whatever. Um, you really have to be like we have to make it out of the highest quality of carbon fiber that we can because that very same 25 foot pole part of me has to be rigid and safe and efficient and precise at 50 feet so we we can't change the composition of the handle because the handle actually goes up in the air and it and becomes part of the pole for example but what happens is if you can imagine anything that gets you know um, longer has more capa capacity or propensity to bend flex break in the middle by the by the nature of its uh, of its length having um, sort of points on the outside holding it up so if you walk across a, a plank and it's only three feet walking across the plank it would be completely rigid but if you made it 10 feet it would flex and if you made it 30 feet it might bow and even break you know depending on its um, strengths so so that's why um, you'll see things like the reach at mini with plus a and plus b we actually make those out of a high modulus carbon fiber for the mini so a higher modulus carbon fiber because as the mini gets extended longer it does start to flex quite differently than the way it is completely rigid at 25 feet so by putting a higher modulus carbon fiber into the center of the pole and up near the top of the pole right that's where it's going to flex when it's being extended we can actually add core rigidity to it and that's why we make plus a and plus b for the mini out of a high modulus carbon fiber and we make plus a and plus b for the reach it pro out of an ultra high modulus carbon fiber so it's more rigid than the pro itself 
And then from, this is just talking about our business, we also have the Procision, which is 100% ultra high modulus carbon fiber, and it works with the Pro Plus A and Pro Plus B, which are the same composition. And that's really the, pardon me, the, um, the, the most rigid solution. The next thing to talk about, because we've got all those compositions, is um, how to make the pole more rigid. And let's talk about um, weight. So some people say, okay, I want to know what the composition of a pole is, and I want to make my decision based on that composition. But if you try this, grab your pole and um, just change the overlap. So with Reach It, we have an eight inch or um, 200 millimeter overlap. And we could also run with a six inch overlap and save material, but those extra two inches make a large difference to the behavior of the pole under pressure. So, oh sorry, under stress. So the flex is reduced by overlap. And if you wanted to increase the rigidity of a pole that you have right now, you could also do that by ultimately having a slightly shorter pole, but by increasing the overlap on every section, in particular the, the, the higher sections. So that's, um, you know, the, the pole design is way more than just the composition. Um, the next thing that we talk about maybe is, you know, this concept of lightweight, which Gardner um, has been very successful in making it uh, feel important. But let me just say this. If you have a 100%, oh, that's a ferry. That's pretty nice. That's, this is the Parramatta River. So you can catch this from Sydney all the way to Parramatta. Um, so if you have a 100% carbon fiber pole, and you wanted to make it lighter, you can't buy lighter carbon fiber. Do you get that? This is where I, it, it's, it just seems so simple when you hear it, and yet it's evaded people for 10 years. The only way to make a carbon fiber pole lighter is to use less carbon fiber. And so therefore the wall thickness of a, of a super light um, pole is less layers of carbon fiber. Now, let's talk about less layers of carbon fiber or any material. Let's talk about three ply timber, five ply timber and seven ply timber. Three ply timber we would use around our home, whatever. Five ply timber they're using on construction sites and seven ply timber they're building bridges with. And the strength of the laminates as they are laid over each other um, are exponential in the strength and power and and long-lasting sort of um, you know because the, the layers are not rubbing against each other inside in microwaves so they're not breaking apart the more layers you've got so you can make and we all can make a much lighter um, water-fed pole by using simply less carbon fiber now the other way to use less carbon fiber is to make the, the, the tube sections less um, diameter. So you might see, you know, that reach it handle section is two inches and for example an unger handle section is one and a half inches. Now if you think about the circumference, you know, of one and a half inches, you know, two pi r and two inches, two pi r, that would give you the ratio of how much less and more carbon fiber there is in that pole. That is okay until you start to do the studies on um, the ergonomics of the human hand. And of all the studies about uh, where they study the grip, I mean, this is, this is quite unique, is what makes a human a human, is the ability to grip like this. A monkey has what's called a bucket grip. Yeah, let me see if I can pull up a bucket grip. <laughs> right, so... Um, when you read, um, and anybody can write to me and ask me for a copy of the white paper, um, and there's more than one, but basically they've done the studies on the, on the Caucasian male, and they said that the, the grip of the male is two inches. That's ideal, right? That the fingers should not overlap. That's, that means he's gripping too hard, and if the fingers are too wide, like the early waterfed poles, then he's gripping with his fingers, the top, the top parts of the fingers and the, and the outside of the thumb. And so that's really also potentially injurious. So having a tube that's too small is potentially injurious and having a, t a tube that's too big is potentially injurious. So right or wrong, I read that stuff when I was designing Reach It. And um, 
it makes it, you know, I mean, we just have a bigger handle section. So, you know, there is always, you know, a, a for and against in every decision that a designer makes. But if you have a look at our um, janitorial and our homeowners polls, then we have similar, you know, that, that thinner handle section because these people are not using them all day, every day. And, um, and even then when we have the bucket grip, um, sorry, the squeeze grip, and we have um, the, the, the action using a water-fed pole, that bothered me. And I had uh, Dr. Douglas J. Mills from Fort Hood, Texas come in, spend three months with me of evaluating it. And we ended up developing the power and control handles to try and reduce the risk of repetitive motion injury for guys working on commercial sites where they're gonna be making the, taking the same action on the wrist continually you know, for eight to 10 hours in a day and then going back the next day and doing it again. So there's, you know, I know that's a slight digression on composition, but it, but the, the issue of making a pole lighter by using less material is, is nice. If it's got less material in it, it should be cheaper, right? That's the, that's the logic. So um, lighter poles should be cheaper, although you can also make a lighter pole with a higher modulus carbon fiber, which was more expensive. So it's a balance up. <laughs> All right, so that's um, the reason why you want to know this is because you need to choose the right tools for your workers. And the thing that you're looking for is not reach, right? If we go back 10 years and 15 years, we're all excited that we could reach a window way up there. But nowadays, 2016, it's about efficiency. Anything can reach, a piece of bamboo can reach, right? The, what we're looking for is what is the fastest tool on the glass and you know having a lightweight pole is not always the best way to go because you need force in the Z direction you need force towards the window to splay the bristles to be able to agitate the dirt into solution if you have a slightly heavier pole and I'm talking like ounces and grams but it makes a difference if you have a slightly heavier pole then as you put that at an angle gravity gets hold of it you know the gravity there is different from the gravity like that and the gravity pushes the bristles against the glass now if you have a crazy light pole then you have to use your body and your muscles to push the bristles against the glass so it's it seems like it makes sense that I should have the lightest pole possible definitely carrying it from the car to the building no brainer light pole is better but when you're actually working on the glass the the actual physics is not simply that oh it's lightweight therefore it's better now I'll tell you where it is better if you're doing two-story um, what do they call them terrace houses the UK market it is completely logical every house is the same they've all got eight to ten windows the guy comes in spends three to eight minutes there he gets three to eight pounds for doing it um, and he does it every four weeks so he doesn't have to apply very much pressure he doesn't have to grind away at a year's worth of dirt in in 40 or 50 but like 100 degrees sun and fahrenheit or 40 50 degrees celsius you know he's just got a whip a brush all over that glass then he's got he doesn't need to apply a lot of force in the Z direction. He just needs to run a brush over the glass. But if he's rinsing off the glass, then that's where that weight, you know, becomes relevant. And, you know, we would argue that Constructor Pro Brush um, eliminates, you know, the two enemies of, you know, sort of the health and, on, and the speed of a window cleaner is off glass rinsing, um, you know, and hydrophobic glass are both solved with that. But we can go into that another day, can't we? So. This is turning into a long video, so I'm gonna finish it up. You should think about every height that you're going to be cleaning windows to. And you should be thinking about, or we are anyway for you, the rigidity of the pole at each height and making sure that when we offer you a solution that it's gonna deliver you a rigid, accurate pole at each height that you're gonna be working at. And then with that rigidity, you are going to um, you're going to have a f you're going to be a faster window cleaner. That's what's going to happen. You're going to clean windows faster, and that's all I'm interested in. I am not about reach. I am about speed, efficiency, and safety. And I'm also about value for money, by the way, because it pisses me off when I see people buying a two-story pole, a three-story pole, and a four-story pole. For example, two plus three plus four is nine 
So buy nine stories worth of poles to reach four stories, and that just doesn't make sense to me. And I'm guilty, by the way. I started in the industry doing this, and reach it is born out of that um, sense of immorality that that I was working and living with. I knew it was wrong, but still, you can see, you know, facelift, Brodex, Gardner, um, you know, all of all of the. The, the, the original brands have never morphed themselves out of the sinking. Then they go and put the tube on the inside and persuade people that that's better so that you can never pull that pole apart. Then you have a tube per pole, a brush per pole, a pole per height. Like none of it makes sense. And the irony, just to bring it back into a full circle, the irony is that the composition of how that pole is made may not be quite what you think because they know exactly what the maximum strain and stress of that pole is. So they can make it more affordable, each pole, but not more affordable for your window cleaning solution, which is like what you're carrying in your van. So um, that is the composition of Waterfed poles from a manufacturer. Let me show you this beautiful place. This is uh, Olympic Park. This is the Parramatta River. I'm signing out from the Armory. This is actually where Sydney, um, during World War II, maybe World War I and World War II, carried its armaments in uh, under mounds of, in, in sort of concrete caves and under mounds of dirt and stuff like that. So it's actually a little bit of history sitting right here. I'm about to have breakfast with a friend. See ya.